Hi there, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Augie. Um, I haven't met many Augies. Uh, I don't know if you have. Augie Rico. I'm a, a lawyer. Um, I specialize in um, representing uh, tech startups uh, in venture capital transactions and mergers and acquisitions. So I help companies um, uh, negotiate the terms of financing and acquire other companies or get acquired on terms that are healthy for the company and healthy for um, building a, a, a unified vision of the company going forward where people can, can work together and, and just really kick a, uh, build a kick-ass venture. Um, so that's what I spend my days doing uh, every day. Um, I'm currently working on about seven different financings. We represent about 25% of the um, Y Combinator companies. Companies we've recently represented in um, financing transactions are ones you've, you've probably heard of. Um, Optimizely, um, Airware, um, a Southern California company, um, crowd tilt. Um, how you see these in in, in, uh, in TechCrunch? Uh, if, you, if you read that, um, and so my you know there are many things we do. Um, it it kind of spans from helping people you know um, uh, um, think about how an investor is going to look at their company when they're pitching it to really the, the technical aspects of how do you model a financing? How do you how do you calculate um, exactly how a, a set of convertible notes are going to convert at a Series A financing in a way that minimizes the dilutive effect on the founder? And some, some fairly technical things like that. Um, but I would I would like to hear kind of what you guys are up to, what you're doing, and also what kinds of questions you have, so that we can um, kind of come in at the right altitude and, and um, take you up on that. Um, uh, sir, what's, what's your name? Um, Michael. Michael. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. What are, you, what are you working on? I'm just sort of exploring right now. Uh -huh. uh, with the early stage financing, uh, lots of companies are having trouble raising their second uh -huh. and becoming sort of zombie companies. Right. And I'm sort of curious as to what opportunities may lie out there. As an investor, as a company, or as a, a business? Or through re restructuring of maybe three or four co companies and uh -huh. make a whole lot of it. So like rolling up a couple companies that have something, okay. Um, so you'd be looking for companies that have um, fungible assets, so assets that someone else, you don't need to have the founders, you don't need to be the visionary yourself, you can take someone's idea and kind of build on it. And together you. a team that's already has some track record. Interesting. What kinds of, um, what, have you seen any companies in particular, not, don't name names, but um, that have a particular profile that's been in interesting to you? I just started on this uh, first one. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Great. Um, someone else? Go for it. My name is Michael. Also. Hi, Michael. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm working on a tech startup, and I'm also working on a fitness infomercial project. A tech startup and a fitness infomercial project. Okay. Independently well, of each other. Right, right. What's the what what what's the business of the of the tech startup? What's the? Uh, it's a social networking uh -huh. a concept that is different than what's out there. Okay. How so? I can't. Can't tell you. In stealth. <laughs> Once in stealth, always in stealth. Remember it. I'm not familiar with that term. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ribbing you. But I think it's true, though. Okay. Um, yeah. I own a website. I just got out of a while called bigfunny.com. It's like pictures of the fun. That sounds familiar. So what is it? Bigfunny.com. So you can organize when you find funny on the internet. So I want to. Um, Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, and um, uh, Comedy Channel just released their, their their comedy app recently. I think there's there's a kind of a tension on comedy discovery now. It's a, something I've been thinking about. Also, so I think it's kind of in the air okay. lately. Um, yeah. Cool. What's what's a big funny? Big funny. And what stage are you at? Or you, is, uh, is there a website? Is there a yeah, there's a website. It's up. It's awkward. Up. Okay. Like, you know, it's not a lot. It's like 500 people signed up. But cool. It's growing, growing every day. How are you finding people are finding you? What, how are people finding you? Um, there's a keyword search, Asia Kira interview, uh, she's a porn star, and uh, somebody did a, a, a funny video on her, a lot of traffic comes through that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so mostly it's starting to get picked up in Google, but I haven't uh -huh. like created partnerships or developed cross-linking with other sites and stuff like that. I've had like a meeting with like a comedy ticketing uh-huh. Okay. Um, I feel like there's a question in there that we should talk about. Uh, okay. Sort of how to, how to identify investors. To, this is the first time. Have you the first time fundraising? Yeah. Yeah. I 
identifying, how to identify um, good investor targets, investors to go after, investors to pursue, and then how to meet them is another thing, but, but how to identify them. Chris. All right, uh, I would like, so we see a lot of, a lot of companies, a lot of different kind of companies, uh, Explore a few things relating to notes, tranched discounts, and I'll explain what that means. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd like to know a little bit. What's, what's your name? Justin. Justin. Uh, I'm advising a startup that's creating a software platform for nightlife venues. Okay, a, a um, software so platform for nightlife venues. Yeah. Okay. And uh, development actually kicked off today. Uh, okay. how we should be structuring our equity and capitalization table sure. most effectively. So, so what, what is the software platform is for, for marketing um, it events? Would be like for reservation management. For reservation management for nightlife venues. Yeah. Like, uh, almost like open table for clubs, bars. Okay, stuff. okay. Um, where, how are people making reservations? I don't, I don't think of night, I might just not party enough. Yep. But I don't think of <laughs> there being reservations in, in a lot of nightlife. Well, for bottle service and stuff like that, for group reservations, rather than just those who show up by the door, but that's a later stage. Okay. Okay. And so the, the question was really, um, you said you raised about 250000 yep. or so, and it's already money in the bank. Yeah. How was it, what was the security that you sold? Was it a loan? Was it It's all loan? equity, so just divided up between six or seven different investors, so. Okay. Um, all is all is common stock? Yeah. Okay. And that's all. Yeah. I'm curious about how we should be structuring that equity. Yeah, now you should be. Thinking, you should be thinking about that's manageable. But there are there are. Um, what, did did someone help you guys with that, or did you? Uh, I'm an investor, so there's a couple guys that are found yeah. that founded the company, and so they handled that themselves. So you you would want to figure out how much to give up as you took the money in. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we all have equity yeah. stakes that are assigned. Yeah. So there, there are lots of lots of aspects of that that would be interesting to talk about. Um, I actually have no idea how much time we have tonight. I, I think this is uh, an hour. Okay, okay. So one thing to talk about there is um, what what are the different choices of different kinds of securities you can sell to raise that money? Common stock, preferred stock, uh, convertible notes, loans, <coughs> there are many others, but those are the main ones. Um, another issue would be um, uh, how do you set the valuation that those get sold at? So what percentage of the company should you be giving up for the, that 200? And how do you how do you determine that? Um, another set of issues around that would be um, sort of sec what kinds of rights should should those investors get with, with their investment? And we can talk about the kind of the, the long list of rights that you know that are that are out there that are on the menu. So um, let's see, what do we call this? Um, what's that? Equity. Well, securitization. No, let's let's say let's call it C. So. Um, seed money, um, the, the type of security, the um, valuation, and then the key terms. Let's get one more kind of group of questions here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jake. Hi. Um, We've met before. Yes, you helped me with that. So Jake, you. Yeah. J, there's like an H in your name. I. An I. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, again. So we, we, we are um, still working on Charlie. Uh, uh huh. Uh, we That's right. You guys did a deal recently. Yes. Okay. Uh, and um, so so right now we we we're part of the accelerator here um, uh -huh. at LA. Cool. And uh, we raised some seed money, and then we're aiming for either angel or a VC funding. Uh huh. And we're still trying to balance between the two, and so if you can go over uh, just pros and cons of each, uh, just make. <laughs> Pros and cons of, yeah, what are, what are the two options you're thinking about again? Uh, Angel and uh, VC. Okay, We're okay. Around, sure, sure. Let's, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that might be a good place to start. 
then we come into the seed financing, and then we'll talk specifically about notes. That might be a good, a good flow. Let's get one more just to make it complicated. Anybody else? Oh, and Jake, um, and actually both of you guys, uh, like to hear what you're doing. I kind of know what you're doing, but what are you working on? What's the business? Uh, so it's a customer retention platform for small businesses. Okay. What's the profile of, of, um, of a, a, a likely early adopter? Um, maybe, uh, restaurants. Um, okay. Um, uh, salon spots. Okay. Uh, local businesses. Got it. Um, there's a lot of competition in that in that area. Yeah, a lot of people trying to say yes. Yeah, it, and particularly in, in customer loyalty and, and right. What are what sort of in, insight do you have on that area? What's your what's kind of different from what you're doing from some of the others? Um, no hardware, no software. Everything is record, first phase. Um, just really minimal friction for the uh, business owners. What do you mean no software? Uh, so everything is pushed to their their, their, their email address. And everything's uh, record based. So okay. they don't need to use the, the dashboard. To go okay. And what was your name again? Justin. Justin, what are you working on? Uh, in general, I work Oh, you didn't miss it. That's right. That's what we got to do. Okay. I have a topic here. I don't know if you want to talk about how you get things started, but I think a good thing to talk about is what people think about when, when it comes to exit. Okay. Sure. Anything? To, uh, there's a lot of... No, I, I, just, uh, I just think it's an important thing. Like why, why are you doing it? What do you want to get out of it? Yeah. How long are you going to be doing it for? Right. Okay. Oh, like exit planning. Exit planning. For, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You well, need to think about that. Yeah. You don't have a lot of control over it. Yeah. So. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear something very in interesting about kind of an interesting perspective on, on exits recently. We um, people have typically been lamenting the the fact that um, IPOs are not such a, a common mm -hmm. exit anymore. They've sort of seen that. Um, the M&A, the, the choices is getting narrower. Um, but they did hear an interesting thought on this and then we'll kind of get into more of a normal flow, but before I forget. Um, so typically when, um, when an acquirer is acquiring a startup, they're not typically acquiring users, they're not typically acquiring um, uh, revenue alone, actually least typically acquiring revenue, um, more, more likely acquiring users, but really what they're looking at is some kind of strategic value, some kind of strategic advantage. And they're willing to overpay for that. Whereas the public, uh, the public markets are not willing to overpay for, for strategic value, right. really. Um, and that's and just kind of an interesting thing to, to do it. Yeah, yeah, and so there are a lot of people who are actually looking at the M&A market as an opportunity to continue building a, a more valuable, longer term vision, um, as opposed to needing to report to stockholders mm -hmm. and, and provide shorter term returns to stockholders earlier on. Mm -hmm. So just an interesting concept, just mm -hmm. someone was talking about. Last and T, Chris, can you talk about team half certain types of As an investor? As a, share, as a shareholder as well. Because isn't there certain cases where it's a price down and they assign a value to the actual shares you get? Sure. Yes, yeah, so let's talk. That'll come up in the, um, in the security yeah. issue. So, okay. So, um, Angel versus VC. So, uh, I don't want to take a stab at the uh, kind of basic <laughs> distinction between these two. What's the difference? Institutional versus in individual. Right. What does that, what does that mean? Yeah, I would say inst institutional means that. I think that the core difference is really whether someone's investing their own money or someone else's money. I think that's really the, the key difference. Um, uh, what if you can accelerate a system in there? Uh, depends how the accelerator is structured. So a lot of ex uh, accelerators are um, have a fund <coughs> that they've raised, and that could be from third-party money, um, or it could be the founder's own own money. And and that really actually affects a lot of the um, sort of the parameters around within which you negotiate your your financing. So if you're raising money from an angel investor. Um, the person typically will have a smaller budget, but more freedom about how they use that budget than a venture capitalist. A venture capitalist will usually have more budget, but less freedom about how they use it. So an angel investor might invest in your company because they like what you're doing, because you graduated from the same college they graduated from, because they, they, want, they think the world should have what, what you have, they, or because they want to be involved in your company. M many different reasons why they invest. The investment size will usually be anywhere from like 5,000 to 100,000, is sort of what, what you see for a typical, like an individual um, writing a check to an early stage company. What's sort of the minimum these days for VCs? 
Yeah, so, so um, uh, VCs, so there's been some, let's, we'll start with the basic, yeah, I'll come back. To, um, a venture capitalist is investing someone else's money. They're investing from a fund. And that means they need to produce a return on that fund. That fund needs to be, as a whole, profitable, that, that they can pay, that producing returns that they can pay out to their investors who invest in their funds, who are usually um, university endowments, um, pension funds, um, large, large, large pools of money that put money into the VC fund, and the VC then invests in the company. Now, the, 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 the venture capitalists will have to, the, their fund will have to make a bunch of investments, kiss a lot of them goodbye as they fail, and will hopefully have one or two or three that produce a large enough return so that the, the $100 million that they took from LPs gets paid back as $150 million or something like that. Now, in order to return $150 million on $100 million, where most of the companies failed anyway, one or two of them has to be a, a really, really huge hit. And so if, if you're negotiating with a venture capitalist for an investment, you need to keep in mind um, the size of the check that they're able to write. Okay, and, and, and often that means that the check that they write, the, the check has to be a certain amount or more, or more. So it's, it's very common that a company will pitch a, a VC firm, um, but the amount of money that they want from the firm is too small and the firm can't make that investment, right? Because even if, even if a $10,000 investment produces a 20X return, it's nothing when you're trying to produce $150 million or you know, $300 million or whatever it is. So the general rule of thumb when pitching a VC is that you need to make the case to the investor, to, to, to the VC, you need to make the case that their investment in you will produce for them the amount of money of their entire fund, okay? So if they have a $100 million fund Right? and they're gonna make 10 investments from that fund, their investment in you needs to produce for them $100 million. Now, if you can do that, idea, then, then it's not worth it, yeah, right. Now, if you produce $100 million for them, they've just broken even, right? They need you and one other to produce the, that, that return. So, so that's kind of the rule of thumb. So think about that when you're talking with these funds. If you're talking with, um, you know, there, there are funds out there that have raised you know, billion dollar funds, um, or more. Yeah, like, and yeah, exactly. And so you need to just, just keep that in mind. And, and they can't write a smaller check because it, it, there's no way that it can produce the, the return that they need. So that's a, that's a fundamental difference. Um, any other questions about, any, oh, now, to, to your question, starting about three years ago, there emerged on the scene a, a, a group of um, professional angels, okay? Now these are people who, or maybe we'll call them um, micro VC. They're, they're, it's a, a kind of a new category of people. This isn't really a term for it, but um, that are investing third-party money. So they're kind of like a VC, but they're making angel size investments. They're investing ten thousand dollars here, fifty thousand dollars here, maybe a hundred thousand, and they're doing high volume. You know, an investment a week, two investments a week, and they have huge portfolios. Um, and the the, the kind of marquee um, examples of this are five hundred startups. Is a big one. Um, SV Angel kind of has been in that category. Um, Soft Tech VC is another one. Um, uh, y Combinator, sort of. You know, the, the, uh, a lot of the, I don't know exactly the terms that Amplify invests in here, but the, the, um, depending on the sort of size of the investment and the number, you can categorize them as sort of micro, micro VCs. And they're investing third party money and they're doing it professionally. They're not taking board seats, um, uh, but they're and they're making lots of, lots of small investments. Now, um, in response to that, so, well, we can talk more about that, but that's just a third category. I'm sorry, what was that yeah. called? Micro VCs, super angels, depends on which side you look at it from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, neither. I would, I, that's, that's a different, a different kind of thing. Um, uh, that's just another, there, there are many other sources of, of financing. You know, there's bank, there's bank financing, there's, you know, there's lots of, I would put, I would put um, crowdfunding as a, a third category. And, and crowdfunding is going to, it's going to take many forms. It's going to, yeah, it's, it's going to take many forms. There, there are people who are going to package it up in different ways. There's going to be sort of curated funding where, 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 where you have someone who's um, picking, um, uh, it's almost like fantasy football, it's picking companies that they think are good and marshalling a bunch of capital to, to follow their picks to invest in companies. And that will be crowdfunded at that stage. From the company's perspective, it's not crowdfunded, it's just coming from one person. But behind that person is a, a crowdfunded fund. It's, that's one 
model is going to. There's lots of different ways it's going to it's going to play out. Okay. Um, let's talk about seed stage seed stage investments. Let's talk about the, the types of securities that you can sell for for a seed stage investment. We'll talk about how you negotiate valuation, how that gets determined, um, and let's talk about key terms. So. We heard about a common stock investment, $250,000 as a common stock investment. Um, how many have heard of Series C preferred stock? How many have heard of convertible notes? How many have heard of convertible notes with a cap? How many have heard of convertible securities? How many have heard of convertible equity? How many have heard of a safe? That's coming. Okay. It's not public yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of it, the, the, what it's going to be is not public yet. So, uh, okay. So there are many different um, things you can sell in order to raise money. Um, you can sell an IOU, a promissory note, right? Someone gives you hundred thousand dollars, you give them a hundred thousand IOU, you owe them a hundred thousand dollars plus whatever interest accrues. That's one kind of security. Um, you pay off the note and you part ways. Uh, you can sell common stock, which is really the most fundamental um, way that you can divide up the equity of a company. Okay. Um, you can sell preferred stock, which is just another kind of stock that has certain preferred, certain better terms built into the stock. And, and there's a lot of freedom with what those terms can be. It can be that they get a liquidation preference, it can be that the, the, the holders of those shares get to vote on certain, get, get like an approval right, the company can't do certain things without that class of those, those preferred stockholders approving the company doing it, such as raising more money or sell, you know, getting acquired or something like that. A whole bunch of things that can attach to preferred stocks. So we have um, uh, loans, common stock, preferred stock. Um, and we have this, we have convertible notes. That's kind of what most people at most companies at the early stage are going to be negotiating and going to be using to, to raise money. Really anywhere up to a million and a half dollars or so a convertible note is is, tip, is, the, is the easiest security to sell. Now, anyone want to take a stab at, um, the, uh, at, at what a convertible note is? Yeah. Um, so there, there is no value that's assigned uh, to the company. Okay. Uh, the, the money is lent uh -huh. um, by the in investor. Um, it can be paid back. Um, or it can convert into equity yeah. at the price of the A round, right. um, which could be at a minimum value, or it could be at a discount. Yep. So they come, they come in at a lower price than the A round uh, investors. So it's a way for them to be secured right. Right, in the early stages, uh, waiting for the company to get yeah. some traction. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, so, so a convertible starts off as a, as a loan. Um, you borrow money from somebody, you have the obligation to pay them back. Now, with a loan, you pay them back with cash. With a convertible note, you pay them back with, with stock. And the question really is, the, the key fundamental economic term in a convertible note is how much stock you have to give them in order to pay them back, right? Um, and, um, the, and, and we call that the conversion price, okay? So you have, a, let's say, a $100,000 note, you have some interest that's accrued on the note, and you have $110,000 when it comes time to, to convert that note. And, and the, the real beauty with a, with a convertible note is um, the, the terms of the note are much simpler than the terms that you have to deal with in a preferred stock financing. They're, they're much simpler. Um, usually there's not a lot of due diligence that goes into, the, into um, uh, a convertible note financing. Uh, usually the company doesn't have to give a board seat. There aren't any kind of voting rights. Someone who, buy, who, who buys a convertible note from a company doesn't get to vote on who the directors are going to be. They don't get to vote on whether or not the company can do certain things. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of negotiation, a lot of terms that get negotiated in a, in a preferred stock financing that just don't get negotiated in a, in, a, in a convertible note financing. And the idea is that you'll leave all the negotiation of all those terms <coughs> to the, the Series A investors. The Series A investors will negotiate all the terms. And the note holders will just piggyback on whatever the Series A investors negotiate. Okay? So the idea is an angel will lend $50,000 to the company. They say, I'm not a professional investor. I don't want to have to negotiate what you can and can't do with, my, with various things. Um, I'll just go along with whatever terms your Series A investor negotiates with you, and my note will become 
Series A stock. You'll pay back my note by giving me Series A, Series A stock. Okay. Now, um, that person who invests early on is going to want to, to get some kind of sweetener for investment. So, let's say the series. Let's say um, a year later, the company raises money at a, uh, raises Series A financing at a dollar per share. Okay. The the person holding the note is. Let's say they invested a hundred thousand dollar. They have a hundred thousand dollar note. They're going to want to get. Series A shares at a slightly better price than just a dollar per share because they give you the, the money earlier. And so there are various formulas for how you're going to discount, how you're going to, how that, how exactly that note holder is going to get a discount off the series. It could be a straight discount, 15%, 20%. It could be calculated in various other ways. And that's really where the negotiation takes place in a convertible note financing. You spend a lot of back and forth on, on exactly how that note is going to convert. Okay, how much of a discount off the series A price is a note holder going to get? And what's a typical discount? Yeah. So the smallest discount I'd seen until three days ago was 10%. I saw a 1% discount three days ago. Um, it was a unique situation. But 10% is a 10% is a 10% a, um, sends the message that we are being um, we are enthusiastically protecting the company's equity. <laughs> it sends a message. It's not stingy, but it sends the message that we're not. Um, that we're thrifty. Most invest, mo I would say the average discount is somewhere between 15 to 25 percent. Right. And, and the discount is usually larger for an earlier investor. So you'll get a, a discount like a 30 you know, percent discount on your first note when, when you have nothing, no company, you get 25 percent, 20 percent over time, it gets smaller and smaller as the company gets de risked. Yeah, and if the company takes longer mm -hmm. yeah. to get that A round, does that discount yeah. increase? It can. It can. It, it, there are usually different ways that it, it, it varies. So let's talk about that. We talked about um, tranched discounts. So, um, kind of going out of order here. So, uh, yeah. Let, we'll, let, let's focus on notes for a little bit. Note, convertible notes are, have become a, a kind of a high art form. There's there, there's a ton of proliferation in, in the terms of notes. There's a lot a lot of variety. Um, one <coughs> someone raise this question about tranche discounts. So the idea here is um, if the Series A investors are paying a dollar per share, the note holder is going to want to pay 75. They're going to want their note to convert to Series A shares at 75 cents a share, 80 cents a share, things like that. Um, when you have, when companies are negotiating with a lot of investors and everybody's kind of waiting to see who, who else will join them, who's going to be first, you know, if so-and-so invests, I'll invest alongside. You get a lot of investors who will say that. If you can find a lead, I'm in. A lot, you get a lot of that. You get a lot of, yeah, I think that's sort of the Hollywood aspect of, of startups. Kind of, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know enough, don't know enough about Hollywood to draw the analogy, but it has a kind of similar feel. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of BS. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so as the um, fund, as the person raising funds, you, you want to find a way to, to get people to commit, to take that first step, to be the first one in. And so one term that people often put forward is um, the first chunk of money. The first person who invests gets you know, a 20% discount or a 30% discount and people after that get And so the way they'll set it up is maybe if you invest in the next, within the next month or in the next week or whatever, you get a certain percentage discount and then that gets smaller over time. Or you can set it up so that, you know, the first $100,000 in, the first $100,000 in, in the round gets a, a larger discount. The next $100,000 gets smaller. Um, usually the chunks are a little bit bigger, like you know, first $500,000 in or get a 25% like that. And that's a way that you can incentivize people to, to take the first step. Um, or you can even say the first person in gets the, the, the bigger discount. So uh, that's what, does, who raised the, the tranche discount question? Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a way to, to, to incentivize people to join, to join the round. Um, and it can be based on time, too, right? Like if, if you invest, you know, my, notes, my notes are going to be open until the end of July. That, that happens a lot. Yeah. What is the advantage of using convertible notes versus handing out equity to sure. early investors? If yeah. You could say that, you could argue that equity is sexier to, you know, you own X percent of the yeah. company and it's easier to entice an investor with that type of securitization. Yeah. I find that's true. Um, in, there are a lot of investors who think that way, and it's very difficult to sort of change their mind. And when you encounter an investor like that, you, there's nothing really you can do. Um, in my experience, those are usually investors who did not sort of grow up in the startup scene. They did not, they aren't guys who, who made a bunch of money in a startup and are now investing in startups. 
They're usually people from other, other industries who are, who are now investing in startups. There are a couple exceptions. Um, Union Square is famous in, in New York for, for preferring equity investments uh, as opposed to note investments. But, it's, but for the most part, the note, the, the advantage of a note is that it's, it's just much cheaper. It's much cheaper for the company. You can complete a convertible note financing for a couple thousand dollars. You could, you could raise $500,000 in convertible notes for a total legal fees of $4,000. What would the comparable amount of raise for equity cost in legal fees? 18 to 28,000. Yeah. If everything goes smoothly. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a, a big difference. And then there's always a risk if it is a convertible note that the, the company just pays the investors back and don't let them let them let that convert, right? Yeah, well most of you can uh, you can get away with that in a friends and family round yeah. where you can put in the note that it's up to the company whether they repay it or convert the note. A professional investor won't allow that. Aunts and uncles won't notice that. <laughs> They'll want, you know, most investors will want it to, that it converts unless they, they choose yeah. otherwise. Um, but you, even if the note expires, even if there's, yeah. like there's not another... Yeah, so what, so what happens if... Now? Yeah, exactly. So let's say, that, so as we said, the, the note starts off as a loan. It's got a maturity date, yeah. you know, like one year or two years or three years. What happens if you hit that maturity date and you haven't had a financing, yeah. right? Um, over the last, there's been a lot of experimentation with, with that term in the last couple of years. Um, there are typically three ways it plays out. Uh, that it gets repaid, that it converts into common stock, and then you have questions about what's the rate that it converts at, and there are lots of different ways you can set it. Um, it can be a third party appraiser, it can be the, the company's stock option price, it can be a fair price determined by the board, if you, whatever it is. So company repays it, converts to common stock, um, or converts to, uh, typically you'll see this a lot, um, what people are calling a, a, a series AA preferred stock. And the series AA preferred stock, it, usually what you'll do is a, at the back of the note, you'll attach a set of terms, kind of like a term sheet for a preferred stock financing. It'll, it'll let, set out the, the 10 basic terms of, of this series AA stock. Um, and if the maturity date comes and goes and there isn't a financing, there isn't a series A financing, the notes don't convert, they'll convert to this, this um, series AA. And you'll, you'll often pick a price that they'll convert at. So it's kind of a hedge. No. Um, there's a lot of experimentation with notes. If anybody's actually negotiating a convertible note round or getting, getting close to it, we, we could talk about all the different things you can be negotiating. Uh, let's talk about uh, valuations. How does the valuation get set? Well, why does the valuation matter? Dilution. Dilution. Well, as an investor, you know, at some point I want to get my money back. Uh -huh. The value the value's too high. How does the valuation get determined? Budget haggling. Budget haggling. Yeah, pretty random, isn't it? It can be pretty random. What kinds of arguments do people use? What kinds of arguments does an investor use to argue the, the, the valuation down? Yeah. What's that? Risk. Risk. But how do they say it's not worth ten million? It's worth eight million. How do they? What argument? What do they? What? Competition. 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 Market size. Market size. Yeah. All those things. What can the company use to, to increase the valuation? Goodwill. Traction, goodwill. There's one thing that's more effective than anything else. Intellectual property. Intellectual property? Intellectual property is a good one, especially in the M&A context. More, more so in M&A deals. Bullshit. More so in, bullshit. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. What's the number two thing? <laughs> Pedigree. Pedigree. Raising more money. What's, what's, what's the most important thing? What's that? Other investors who are willing to pay more. That's the single most important thing. Yeah, that, that's, that's all that really matters. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of bullshit that goes into making it look like you have other investors who want to invest more. And maybe you do have other investors, but, that, but that's really the, the single thing that, that drives it up. It's, the, it's not needing the money because you have other sources of money and there, there's another sexy investor who's, who's joining the round. Joining the, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing. Now, um, there's another thing, it's a little, a little subtler, but uh, 
once you have someone committed to invest in your company, they, they've expressed, they, they want to they invest. With angels, there's usually kind of a cap on how much they can invest. You know, they just have their personal budget. You know, they just can't shell out more than 50,000 or whatever. Uh, for VCs though, there's, there's usually not, not so much of a threshold or ceiling. You know, they could write a $2 million. They have the, they will typically have, if they're investing, if they have an active fund and they're making investments, they can usually invest 2 million or 5 million or 7 million. Yeah, well, it, gets, it gets hard. There's, there is a limit, but 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 usually there's a lot of room. Um, now, the basic formula uh, for for evaluation is um, if you if you take the amount of money that they're putting into your, to the company and the percentage of the company that they're getting, right? So let's say they're putting in a million dollars and they're getting ten percent of the company. That's a, a ten million dollar valuation to your company. Okay. Now, for most. Uh, for most VCs, the percentage of the company that they need is fairly fixed. They, they need somewhere between 20 to 25 percent. Right? Um, can't make the invest just like can't write a check for ten thousand dollars. Can't can't take can't justify an investment um, for you know just a, uh, um, a, a small percentage of your company. They need somewhere between 20 to 25. But they can write either a two million dollar check or a four million dollar check or a six million dollar check. Okay, those three options double and triple your valuation, right? So $2 million for 20% of your company is, implies one valuation. $4 million for 20% of your company is double that valuation, okay? That, that's, that, that's, you're doubling your valuation. Now, how do you get them to, to, to write a check for four million instead of two million? A lot of salesmanship. A lot of salesmanship. As much reality as you can hang around with as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll often, many times in a um, kind of the final stages of a, of a negotiation before before you get the term sheet, but as the as you're about to seal the deal, sort of the the, the, the kiss at the end of the day, you know, you see the kisses coming, what kind of kisses are gonna be that so that stage, not in the term sheet yet, but kind of you wooed you've wooed them and you're just kind of figuring out the sort of trajectory of the <laughs> approach. Um, there will come a question where the investor asks how much money you need and what you're gonna use it for and, and what kind of milestones are you gonna hit with that money. Right? Now if you can paint a compelling picture of hitting milestones, so back up. When an investor makes an investment, they need within a year or 18 months, they need to be able to show their fund that it was a good investment, okay? So they need, within a year, a year and a half, they need you to raise money from, from someone else at a higher valuation. So that their investment in your company now has a high, higher value, and that shows that, that, that it was a, six, a, a good investment. Okay, now you need to impart in them confidence that you're gonna hit meaningful milestones that are gonna allow you to raise money at a higher valuation a year out, a year and a half out. And so the way you get them to write a $4 million check as opposed to a $2 million check is to paint a compelling picture of what you're going to do with $4 million that's both ambitious and doable, that you, that you are able to do, um, that's ambitious and doable, and you'll get the check for $4 million, you have twice the valuation that if you hadn't put as much work into your business plan. That's kind of what it, what it comes down to. Um, We could talk about key terms. I feel like that might be a little bit more technical than, than people want to talk about, but we'll hit them at a high level. So what might an investor ask for when they're uh, um, considering investing in your company? They're going to write you a million dollar check, either as a convertible note or part of an equity round or something like that. What might they, what strings, we call it strings, it's kind of cynical, but what, what, what do they want with that? Could be dilution protection. Dilution protection, yep. So, What's that? A board seat. A board seat? Yep. Some, some veto powers against you doing dumb things. <laughs> yep. Yep, we call those protective provisions. <laughs> I don't know if this could be a key term, but can you ask in a term, as a key term, how pretty you are to internal information? Like, uh, so yeah. About the company? Yeah, we call it information rights. Yeah. They want information rights. Yeah. yeah. What else? Oh, 
the, we call those participation rights or pro rata rights or, or um, a right of first offer. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of companies get screwed lately with, with participation rights. And you, you, want, you think like how could, what could be wrong with giving someone a right to, to buy part of your next round? But I've seen, I've seen it, it, it cause a lot of problems. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of companies get screwed, right? uh -huh. uh, is that because of negative signaling? It can be. Um, let's talk about negative signaling. Uh, so do you, you want to explain it? Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is important for a lot of early stage startups. This is actually, to me, the biggest debate between Angel and VC at early okay. stage. Is if you, if you have the opportunity to take some, a good amount of jump from a VC, your best bet is to actually go to the angel because say for some reason you don't need your metrics and you can't go to raise a series A, B, or C, and you want to go back and raise a bridge round or a smaller round, if that initial VC that probably has a lot of respect and a lot of influence in the area isn't going to participate in the bridge or the next round of financing, all of your future investors are going to ask why they didn't participate. Yeah. And that's going to tell them, that's going to send negative signal in. So when you go to pitch an angel and you say, oh, I mean, you go to pitch a VC and your angel's not get jumping in all the bridge round, it's easy to say, oh, it's just it's too rich for his blood. Yeah. So rather than saying, oh, my VC doesn't want back in on this next round. Yeah. Uh, and they have a lot yeah, so you've had these, these super angels and these micro VCs kind of crop up, and the, these, these people are raising lots of, um, doing lots of, lots of $50,000 investments, you know, a couple a week. Um, now, uh, for a lot of VCs, there's competition to cultivate relationships at that stage with, with early stage companies um, and, and watch them. And um, if they develop, they, they become possible investment targets. Uh, they're losing control of their deal flow, losing control of their pipeline because this new kind of power broker has emerged, this, this super angel or the, or the, the, micro, the, the, the micro VC, which um, has its, each, each one of those guys has their own relationships with VC funds and, and they, they syndicate deals with them. And so there's competition to, to, to kind of um, have a, a, a hook in the, in the water, fishing line in the water, kind of have, have a pool of early stage companies that you have small investments in so that, you, that, so that from the VC's perspective, you have the opportunity to invest in them as, as they grow. Okay, now, so a lot of funds like Andreessen Horowitz are making tons and tons of you know, $50,000 investments in companies, um, way more than they can follow up follow up on, you know, way, way more. And when, if, if you've raised $50,000 from Andreessen Horowitz or, or any of the other funds that are doing this, um, and then you go out to raise your Series A round, your investors will ask, the, the people you're pitching will ask you, is Andreessen joining the round? They know your company, they've been, they invest in your team round. Are they joining the A round? Why aren't they leading the A round? And those are very, very difficult questions to deal with. They're really, really difficult. Uh, there's, no, there's no good, the only good answer is, they have another investment in a competitive company, and they can't do it. Yeah, that's, a, that's really the only good answer. And so you, you, you keep that in mind. For yeah. Your point about it is that in that, sense, in that case, you should go back to an Anderson Horowitz and ask them if they want to participate, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But the, the risk is if they, but it may have nothing to do with your company. The reason they don't invest may have nothing to do with your company. And the chances are that they're not going to be able to invest. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was the best line to deliver? Um, the best line to deliver. Well, you know, the only the only time when when a new investor is asking why the seed investor isn't leading your A round, the only good answer there is is because they, they invest they have another competitive investment in another in another company that's competitive with mine. And then then you're perfectly fine. There's no there. The new investor knows that Andreessen can't, or whoever it is, can't invest in you. But um, but other than that, there's no real good. You, there's a lot of there's 80% answers, but it's there's no there's no good answer. And if it's an angel, you say it's just too much money. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, what is the VC? I mean, I guess if I'm the that VC, I'm saying, well, how does that argument make any sense? Because they wouldn't invest in the competitor. That yeah. Was they're already with me, so I don't think I do a competitor if that's an issue with them. Yeah, I think, I think people are able to digest that. Yeah, I think people are able to digest it because you know they invest in one company when it's very early stage. They're interested in an area. They, right. they make you know they make a lot of investment, and one you know took off earlier than the other, and no one 
there's no shame in that. There's, there's nothing, you know. <laughs> that's that's just part, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a million, a million, a million, a million reasons. Um, but that's the negative signaling problem. The pro rata, here's the, here's the issue with, with pro rata rights or participation rights or, or rights of first, the, the right to participate in the next round. So recently had a company um, that uh, um, raised about $500,000 from a, um, a venture fund on a convertible note and the venture fund got, with that convertible note, the right to buy 25% of the company's next round. Okay, sounds fine, doesn't sound, sound like a problem. Um, the company got a term sheet from top, you know, a very top, top tier uh, VC fund for a $10 million round and that investor wanted 90% of that round. Oops. <laughs> that, and those were the terms. We'll invest in you if we get 90% of this round and for that other 10, we're bringing Sean Parker and a couple other famous people to fill out the rest of that round. It took them about two months to resolve it, to, to resolve that, that, that situation. The 25% the um, pro rata right holder wouldn't back down. They wouldn't back yeah, down. Not What's that? Not then. Yeah, they didn't, yeah, they wouldn't, wouldn't back down. Um, and it got very adversarial. And they saw the same thing happen about a month later, and then again about a month later. So see three times in the last, last six months. Now this, um, this particular deal, the way they resolved it was, um, Two different things. A lot of bashing on the, the 25% uh, holders head. Um, also went to all their other different note holders and negotiated sort of a everybody is going to compromise on something and kind of shamed them into going along with it. Um, and then at one point it got it's kind of it was a sort of a technical solution, very very hardball solution. Um, the lead investor was ready. We had this guy plan this out. Was ready to withdraw a term sheet, let let the period run out on the deal. You, know, you have 90 days or whatever 30 days to do the deal. Let the period run out, say we weren't able to come to a deal, weren't able to close the deal, um, call the deal off, issue another term sheet for instead of 10 million, 750,000, 750,000, which would force all the note holders, to, all the other notes to convert, yeah. and that 25% pro rata right holder would get 25% of a $750,000 round. Oh, shit. <laughs> and then issue another term sheet. So that, was the, that was the plan. And kind of on the eve of, of doing that, they, they caved. They took like five percent of the round or something like that. Yeah. So you can get screwed. And yeah. and and the, what's really the, the lesson there is, and this this comes up um, in in a lot of early stage stuff. Um, when you get a term sheet from an investor, you want to be able to move from term sheet to close as quickly as possible. Right? Deals fall off the rails for a million different reasons. Right? I mean, a deal can fall apart for it for for a lot of different reasons. And an additional week on the, the, the period of time to close the deal is a, a, a big threat to the deal. So you want, you want to re keep open your, your ability to, to move and make decisions and close deals um, as freely as you can. That's a big theme that comes up in all the, every topic that we could discuss today. Yeah. Are there any protective rights for a founder where you have to make your investors convert to equity on the little note? So say for instance, I saw a company once raise 200K from an investor and they, they wanted to go raise another, like another 250 just to, you know, give them like another year of runway. But when they went to go um, raise more money, they had to go back to that original investor and he was like, I don't want any yeah. of this next round. I'm gonna let my next round be making me pay me 200,000 plus whatever. Sounds like an asshole. So, yeah, he's a big asshole. So basically, they, if they would have raised that next round, they would have had to use all that cash to pay their investor back. Is there any kind of anything that they could have done at the very beginning to protect them from well, a situation like that? Here's a, here's a theme. So when when you're negotiating with investors, um, there are a couple themes you want to kind of um, always bring the conversation back to. And sometimes they'll propose a term, and you, it's your first time hearing about that term, and you don't really know the implications of it. Sounds kind of okay, but you just don't know. You don't want to go to your lawyer every single time. Maybe you don't have a lawyer. You don't want to. You want to be able to move the discussion forward, but but you, you, don't, you can't really evaluate the, uh, the sort of technical implications of, of a particular term. A theme, you can always kind of up, le up level and say, you know, we deal with those specifics in a bit. Let's come back to kind of basic, basic themes, basic topics, basic themes in our relationship here. 
And one important theme that you want to harp on, you want to set, set this tone a lot early on in negotiation, is that their investment is um, an economic investment, and it's, and, and it's, it's fine to have various bells and whistles that protect the, the economics of their investment, but they, they're, they're not, um, they don't get the right to control the company. So it's economics, but not management. And that's a, that's a good theme to come back to. And, and you, you want to use that phrase for economics, not management, economics, but not control. Um, use, those tr use that distinction a, a lot. And that's something you can always kind of come back and anchor technical arguments into later when you kind of get, get deeper into it. But so like in that case, um, I, I, I missed some of the details about it, but it sounded like the person had a right to really control whether the, the company raises yeah. raises money. Yeah, he basically was just someone that his nose as far and not convert to equity in the next round, and then have that company owe him his initial investment, which was two hundred thousand. The next round was going to be like two hundred fifty thousand, and they needed all I see. Things, you know two hundred grand that would walk right out the door. No investor is going to jump in a round where two hundred thousand dollars is going to walk right out the door as soon as they yeah. close that round. I've I've never seen a note where the note holder has the choice of whether it converts or. I've seen, I've seen where, I've never seen a note where the note holder has a right to, to choose whether it converts or not at a, at a financing that reach, that has certain um, oh, okay. criteria. Okay. So a financing where, where the company's raising a million dollars or more, yeah. selling preferred stock and raising a million dollars or more, the note converts automatically. Okay. The, the prior note holder's note converts automatically. Like I've never seen them have a, that choice in that situation. Okay. I have seen them have the choice where for fi for events that don't meet that threshold. Yeah. So. Note converts automatically if the Brown's a million dollars or more, but if it's below that, the note holder gets the choice of whether it converts yeah. or not. This would have been that case because I think they were only going to raise like another two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not as big as whatever that. Uh, yeah. You you I mean, you know, you're lucky if you have the leverage to to, to make these choices, but um, but you 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 want. Try to try to get a sense of whether your investor is the type of person who needs who, whether they, the type of person whether the investor would would call that note. It's it's very it's almost unheard of for a, a professional startup investor to call a convertible note to, to require repayment. Well, I've never actually seen it happen. I've never actually seen a note. I've never seen a note holder actually demand repayment. I've dealt with five hundred convertible notes in the last few years. I mean, it's, I've never seen one get called. <laughs> yeah. So get a, try to get us, and, and usually the investor will do that if they if they need it. You know, it's a, if they're pushing their limit on 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 you know, their own budget, their own ability, you know, it's cash that they can't really do without. Sure. Sure. I was going to say, and another issue that, that I've come across a fair amount is the eagerness slash desperation yeah. of the founders to get money. Yeah. And they really, in their minds, the, it's like the psychology. Well, if that will it will never happen in the future. Yeah. And reality is, it does. Happen. It does, and the, and the reality is they have to take the money. Yeah. The best, the best defense, the best negotiating tactic is to have a kick-ass product that lots of people need. Yeah. yeah. Are there any challenges with having a convertible when you're a LLC or um, S corp? Yeah, uh, S corp, no. Um, although when you convert. S corp can't have preferred stock; it can only have common stock. And so, when it converts, <coughs> you'll lose the S corp election. It's just for your, just so you know. But it doesn't matter. But just so you know, um, with LLC, LLCs are kind of tricky, uh, uh, but only really in the. How do I put it? Um, it's kind of an interesting topic for lawyers to geek out on, but <laughs> but it's for your purposes, it's totally fine. <laughs> I'll spare you the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, um, typically, it will be tied to. Uh, the, there will be a, a condition in the note that says that the LLC has to convert to a C corporation at the conversion. Yeah. Can you talk Just a little bit about dilution and what yeah. provisions you can include in your terms to. Uh, you know, yeah. Like yeah, and let's also talk about your question about. Oh, we never did hit it about. Um, uh, Raising money on, on uh, why there are challenges around raising money on common stock. Right. You know, selling common stock for more than a few pennies a share has has certain problems, and, and we'll, let's, we can talk about that. Um, this question, is it, say this question again. The, the I was just curious about dilution and what kind yeah. of protection provisions you include to protect against that. Yeah, for, um, 
there are two or three different kind of basic formulas. Uh, one's a, the, the most draconian is called full ratchet. And there's a broad-based weighted average and a, and a narrow-based weighted average. Um, you can also get kind of a, um, just a, a warrant. Um, so let's say an investor uh, buys 10% of the company. Um, uh, the anti-dilution protection can come in two different flavors. Um, one is they might get protection to, to maintain their 10%. So if the company issues more shares, they get topped up so they stay at 10%. That's, that's one kind of, that's kind of like a voting dilution, anti-dilution. Um, the other kind of anti-dilution is, is more of an economic anti-dilution. So if the company um, sells shares at a, you know, a $5 million valuation and an investor buys 10% of the company, right? And they sell more shares at a, at a 20, $20 million valuation. Now the investor's percentage has gone down, but the value of, of those shares that they held has gone up. Okay, so there's a voting dilution, which usually investors don't care about, and there's an economic dilution, which, and, and so, uh, if the company raises money at a $5 million valuation, and then raises money at a $3 million valuation, not only has the investor gone down in their percentage of the company, but the shares that they have, that they hold, have less economic value than they did before. And so, an typical anti-dilution provisions will entitle that investor to receive additional shares to, to top them up, to top up the economic solution. Yeah. Oh, no. probably. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's present in almost every deal. Um, raising money on common stock. So uh, this is also a little bit technical, but, but if you're going to um, raise thousands of dollars, uh, talk with a specialist before you do so. Um, uh, it, selling common stock for, um, for more than you know, a few cents a share can make it difficult to issue stock options to employees in the future. Just kind of, we could leave it at that. Yeah. Well, can you go into a little bit more? more? Depth as to why? Yeah, yeah, so when you issue uh, stock options to an employee, um, the, the, here's, how, here's how an option basically works for those who don't know. Uh, at point in time, you issue an option to buy common shares, common stock of a company. So you're not actually issuing stock, you're issuing an option to buy the stock. Now, in any option, the, um, the key term is what, what's the exercise price for that option? How much do they have to pay to buy, that to, to, to buy whatever it is? Um, uh, the IRS requires that stock options be issued with an exercise price equal to the common stock's value on the day that it's issued. Okay, so you can't, if a company's kind of gone up, let's say the, the value of the common stock has gone up over time, the company can't issue stock options to an employee but give them the old exercise price from a year ago. I thought you can do that, but you just have to expense for it properly. Um, you may be able to mitigate the penalties by expense. I, I don't know, but you can. There will be pretty heavy penalties yeah. for it. There's a real strong argument for using preferred stock for the valuation. Uh, let's come back to that. Yeah. So, um, so you issue the, the options at the fair market value on the day that the data you issue the options. And over time, the value of the common stock goes up, but the person gets to buy buy that stock in the future at the price at the value that it had on the day that they got it. Okay, so let's say that the, the price the value per share is ten cents per share on the day they grant on the day that the employee joins the company and gets options, they get an exercise price of ten cents a share. A year later, the, the common stock is worth five dollars a share. For ten cents a share, they get to buy that five dollars share stock. And so that that's that that delta is what really matters for them. Now, if you have so. For purposes of granting stock options to employees, you want the you want the exercise price to be as low as possible. Okay, the lower the exercise price, the bigger the delta between the value later when they exercise. Right? If you grant an exercise price of two dollars a share, you know, when the company when the when the common stock has a value of two dollars per share and they exercise at five, that's only a three dollar a share value. You want it to be as low as possible so that the delta is large. If you sell common so you're, so companies are always trying to. Um, uh, uh, make the case that the common stock is not worth much. The, the venture as a whole is worth a lot, but the common stock is not worth much. That's the case. You want to sort of marshal evidence that, that shows that. But doesn't 100% of all the common stock equal to total valuation? Uh, no. Because it's common plus preferred plus whatever. Yeah, so um, a lot of the value is in the preferred, there's, there's the, the val more of the value is, is, is in the preferred stock. Or like the founder stock too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 
that's part of the reason you have these other kinds of stock is to, to show the values in, in, a, in a different part of the company's capital structure. Now, if you if, if you sell common stock at ten thousand, you know, let's say you sell twenty five percent of your company, common stock equal to twenty five percent of your company at you know for a hundred thousand um, dollars, you, you're you're saying that the common stock value the, the IRS will look at that as evidence of the value of the common stock, and so it's difficult to if you then issue stock options below that you're issuing it for less than the, the value of the. So you're saying it's harder to attract new talent with a higher strike price because the eventual valuation of those options is going to be less than if the strike price was lower. Right. Right. And the strike price that you issue that will have to be, you can't sell common stock at $2 a share and then turn around and say the value of the day is a penny a share. Because you just sold it to a third party for $10 a share. Is that another reason why they are doing yeah. Go into. Actually, yeah. Then what happens to the convertible notes? They turn into preferred. They turn yeah. Yeah, that's exactly why. So, so you want, that's one of the one of the big reasons is you you want to put money into a company without jacking up the the value of the common stock. And then, do you have to set the common stock uh, at some point if you're a corporation? Do you have to set the value? The yeah. value of the yeah, once every 12 months or so, you'll hire a, a third party to, to do a, a report that you then rely on. Yeah. 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 How do you use options as a leverage point if you can't offer them to a talented employee or recruit at a valuation that makes sense for them to uh, leverage stock options? You do want to. Yeah, you do, you do want to. It, they're, more, they're more potent earlier on. Yeah. They're also very potent right before IPO or something like that, but yeah. yeah. Questions, comments, particular problems anyone's wrestling with? So that's a unique situation where you have, a, that only matters, I think, I mean, tell me, Ron, I don't have a lot of clients like that, so I don't have yeah. a lot of experience with it, but my spidey sense is telling me that that only is relevant for companies where the, um, the company has a lot of losses, but the founders have a lot of, um, yeah. a lot so, of income yeah, elsewhere. So the founders, you know, well, one, one example is the, the founders are all in their mid-50s and do very well in other aspects of their you know, financial yeah. portfolio. And, you know, this is a great little tax haven. But, yeah. but also, you know, companies doing well and they're giving investors and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I've never seen anyone stick with the S corporate S election for, for very long. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I actually don't have much experience with it. Okay. Uh, I'd be curious to hear how you handle it. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? So what's yeah. the ideal securitization mix for a startup? Yeah, so, yeah, so typically, um, you'll, I think it's convertible notes early on. Um, I think those, the convertible notes over, over time um, get smaller and smaller discounts, higher and higher valuation caps. These are all the terms that, that affect the rate at which the note converts into preferred stock. And they become more and more company friendly terms over time. And then when the company's um, uh, uh, raising its Series A round, you want those you want to be sure that those, uh, if I say that you want those notes to convert into post money as opposed to the free money, that's, that's a, key, a key point. Um, yeah, no, convertible notes are fantastic. I encourage people to become very literate in convertible notes. There are lots of read um, venture hacks. Um, uh, it's a good website to get, your, get more literate. Read a, a book um, by Brad Feld called Venture Deals. I'd read that. Um, those are two good, two good sources. Get, get, get literate with convertible notes so that you get, so that you get comfortable and confident negotiating. Huh. So, 
That's what I have to say tonight. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah.